Hello, book two. All right, we're up to three, part three of our, our 10K Q&A. We're up to Duffy Pratt. Uh, number one, what do you think of James Elroy? I think he's brilliant. Number two, what do you think of Lawrence Block, particularly the Scudder and Burglar books? They're okay. They're ordinary. Uh, and number three, the McDonald brothers, Ross, John, and Philip. I actually kind of sort of like them all. Uh, I don't love them all. I don't love any one of the three of them. Uh, and with Philip, did you like The Brave? These aren't going to cause me to squeal. These aren't Steve authors, really. Uh, Gabriella Zapoltalova says, Congratulations on 10K. Your starter kits are fantastic. Thank you. Would you make? Would you consider making one on the following list of subjects? Winston Churchill, Foxes, Martin Luther King, Naval Stories, Captain the Great, Conquering the Moon, The Celts. I would. I would consider not all of them. I would add them to the list. Beating Around the Book says, uh, Congrats. It really is a staggering number. I agree. Staggering. Uh, you recently mentioned that you wish more people would read early 20th century German writers. What are your thoughts on uh, Masha Kaleko? I, I have a friend who loves her, just says, you know, even if you don't like poetry, you, you, you just try it. And I, it's never worked, but it might, it might someday. Uh, Matthew L. says, can you name your three or four favorite novels by Virginia Woolf with a little explanation as to what you like about each one of them? I just finished The Waves, and it struck me as being precisely the kind of modernist novel you typically wouldn't enjoy. Perhaps I'm way off about that. I don't know how to rank my favorite novels by Virginia Woolf, but, but I know the, I, I'm not against modernist tricka, trickery in a novel, provided it's not condescending. Provided it's not trying to, pre to present itself as a mystical voice from beyond. An extension of your last marijuana high. In other words, as long as it's not trying to do that, then I'm okay with, with inventiveness. And Virginia Woolf never condescends. Never. Fiction, nonfiction, book reviews, never. She never condescends. So I don't mind it at all in her case. Uh, Anthony Suppa says, When watching live performances of Shakespeare, do you prefer sets and costumes to be in the traditional Elizabethan style or a modernized contemporary style? Do you have the same preference for film adaptations? I don't care about clothing at all. I don't care about the, the dress. I care very much if the sense of the thing is destroyed uh, or, or if I get the sense that the modernizer doesn't understand the text. <laughs> like, for instance, Ethan Hawke's Hamlet, <laughs> less said about the better. Uh, but no, generally speaking, the presentation doesn't matter to me. Uh, Roy Testa Ray Testado says, congratulations on MK. Number one, with the exception of the Bee Gees, <laughs> name two other groups or artists that you like. I could name a million. Fleetwood Mac, Simon and Garfunkel, Queen, <laughs> quite a few. I could go on. Uh, number two, I enjoy the Easton Press, but the books are so expensive. Do you recommend the Barnes & Noble Classic Edition? Yeah, the Easton Press and Folio Society are very expensive. They are very beautiful, though. If you're an aesthetic book collector, if that's something that you value, boy, oh, boy. I almost say they're worth the money, except it's so much money. But, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the Barnes & Noble Leatherbound Editions because they are great. The Leatherbound Classic Edition uh, volumes are just beautiful. There's a large number of them now. A whole bookcase of those would look beautiful. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would recommend them, certainly. Uh, David Adams says, you can meet any author at any time, point in time. Who would it be, and what would you talk to them about in relation to their writing? I'm never very good with this kind of question, because the people I would want to meet would be authors I have known who are dead. I would want to meet them again just to talk to them. So I, I can't divorce that. So I, I guess the typical answer here would be Shakespeare. But I, I don't, I can't divorce this from the personal element. Uh, Mona Doyle says, congratulations on such a milestone. I love your Q and A's. You have fans and followers who watch your, that watch your vlogs. What? Thank you. Uh, TDub 1945 says, hi, Steve. After the lurker comment, I was motivated to ask a question. I have recently called out my lurkers for lurking. Steve needs constant validation. Uh, my favorite book of all time is Grapes of Wrath. As for me, it is one of the very few books that complements my love for fiction and history. What would you recommend that comes close to the way in which a story so deeply contextualizes a time period? Uh, well, you're not going to like... Most people who like Grapes of Wrath or other books like that don't like my recommendations because I'm going to recommend authors that a lot of people have been taught or told are somehow uh, sub rosa, somehow, somehow lowbrow. I would recommend James Mishnah, for instance. His great books are a terrific mixture of fiction and history. I'd also recommend uh, Herman Wook the author of the Cain Mutiny, wrote two volumes called uh, uh, The Winds of War and War and Remembrance that are really good in exactly that way. But he wrote, a lot of his other books are like that too. And 
I could also I could say the same thing for Leon Uris. But these people are you have been you have been the book world has been conditioned to think there's something lesser about them. Uh, so I'd recommend them anyway. But you have a follow up question, don't you? I'm currently reading Nixon Agonistes and loving it. Also have have started the Death of the Messiah two volume series that you got in your mail hall a while back. Great. Uh, Melissa Furman says, congratulations on 10K. Thank you. Uh, Vera Pavlova says, congratulations on 10K. My question is, what are the best editions to read of Shakespeare's plays in? Uh, well, the best edition probably is the second edition of the Riverside Shakespeare. Big brown book, the tapestry on the cover. That's probably the best in terms of critical apparatus, the notes, the variants, the introductions, everything. Uh, but I want to stress that you don't need that. You don't need to do that. You a, a normal paperback edition that just has simple footnotes, so that you sometimes Shakespeare is using words that we don't use anymore. You want to know that, especially if it's important to the passage. You don't need anything much more than that. So you don't need to do more than just an ordinary annotated paperback. Uh, Justin Raymond says, well, "Hi Steve, what do you think of Karen Armstrong's History of God? Do you think her take is historically sound? If not, are there others you consider better?" I think her take is probably historically sound. I, it's her writing that, that has never done it for me. She's kind of a boring writer. Uh, but along uh, close lines, I would definitely recommend Jack Miles. God, a biography, is a great book. Fantastic book. Not exactly the same thing, but well worth your time. Uh, Revenant Reads says, uh, number one, any chance of a gothic starter kit? <laughs> uh, number two, what are your choices for great anti-war fiction? I love Johnny Got His Gun, and I assume Lysistrata would make your list. Uh, it would, and there are a number of others. I, I automatically think of nonfiction, uh, including a book by Chris Hedges, who's an author I don't typically like. He wrote a book called War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning that I thought was fairly thoughtful. Extra thoughtful for him, but fairly thoughtful just in general. Well, well worth a read. Uh, Matthew Baxter says, Hello, Steve. Do you have any advice you would give to people trying their hand at book reviewing for the first time? Uh, yes, I would. I am... Uh, okay, uh, several pieces. Let, let's we'll pull back first. The, the big pieces of advice I give, the number one big piece of advice I can give is to read book reviews. It's amazing to me how many people I meet and I have met in the last 50 years who wanted to write, to write book reviews. And what they mean by that is write for pay who don't read book reviews. I, don't, I can't imagine anyone thinking that same, having that same goal about anything else and saying, well, the first thing I'm going to do is ignore the thing that I want to get good enough to get paid at. Number one, I'd say read book reviews. Uh, but the other thing I'd say is read up on where you can submit book reviews. Does your local newspaper run original content? Most of them don't anymore. Most local newspapers either have eliminated their arts coverage, books included, completely, or they reprint stuff that comes from elsewhere. They just pay a wire fee and reprint or ask permission to reprint for free but they don't run local writers at all does your lo your local newspaper or the biggest regional newspaper do that if they do well then on their masthead they will have either an arts editor or an opinion editor or a book editor you can get in touch with that person and pitch a review uh, but the number one thing to do is to practice book reviewing you have to read book reviews and you have to learn the lay of the land where are you actually going to send a book review once it's good enough to be read but the main thing you want to do is practice it. Again, I have lost count of the number of people I have met who say, I really want to get into book review. And I say, have you ever written a book review? And they say, no. <laughs> when they don't need this advice in anything else, right? If I would say to that person, what do you think I need to do to prepare for running a marathon next year? They would say, well, first you should start off with a little running. <laughs> they don't need that advice, except with this, where they somehow think that it doesn't apply. If you want to get good enough, good at something, you have to practice it many, 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 many times. Hours and hours of practice. So when, when people contact me and say, you know, what should I do? I say, find a book that you've either just read or that you plan to read, take notes on it, and write a book review. And for, for practicality's sake, just as practice, keep yourself to 800 words. So that those are all sort of 30,000 foot advice. And then the more proximate advice would be that I am an editor at an online literary journal called Open Letters Review. And we have a lot of good people on the masthead. We have a respectable lineup on the masthead, including some booktubers you know, and some published authors, and a couple of professional book reviewers who do nothing else. It's not a bad place, in other words, to try out to, to for your work to appear, and I will help you if you want to do that. Just email me. Uh, 
let's see here. Uh, Anya Konda says, uh, I'm not sure if this has been asked in past Q&A videos, but I'd love to know what are your top three translated Japanese books and why? I don't know if I could do a top three. Although, in, in one way, I would say three different translations of Tale of Genji. Uh, the Washburn, the Royal Tyler, and and the Seidensticker. And maybe Arthur Whaley thrown in. Maybe I would just say that. Just multiple translations of the same work. That always fascinates me. Uh, Laura Winchello says, Hi, Steve. Do you have any favorite Don Camillo stories? No, not individual stories, no. Often, also, you often refer to your Jesuitical education. Can you please explain what that involved? Well, it involves the Jesuits, who, among other things, including many indictable crimes, uh, value the idea of using the mind as a muscle value the idea of intellect and rigorous inquiry as being adjuncts to faith, weapons of faith, not uh, opposites of faith. The, if you encounter, you won't probably, if you're lucky, encounter such a person, but in wide swaths of the so-called Bible Belt here in the United States, you will find uh, low-information Christians, some variation of that, of that term that they use to describe themselves. That they really just want to believe. They really don't want to hear anything about text or analysis or variance or anything like that. Least information, bare information, Christians and Jesuits would throw up if they saw, <laughs> if they saw that. That is to them the the antithesis of what faith is. It should be the thing that is most able to withstand rigorous inquiry, not least able. Uh, in sense of devoting their lives to it. Uh, let's see here. Eric says, "How did you first get into book reviewing?" Did you actively pursue it? Did a friend or colleague ask you to give it a try? I was writing uh, editorials. I was writing op-ed political editorials about benighted U.S. presidents and all sorts of benighted local figures who were caught with their hand in the cookie jar and whatnot. And the art section editor, a dear old man, asked me if I would write a book review. We always talked about books. We went to lunch and would talk about books all the time. And he was short for material and wanted to know if I would do that. I'd never tried it before, but I'd read book reviews. Uh, and I did try it. And it was fun. It was a huge amount of fun. Uh, and I just kept doing it. <laughs> it's, it stayed a lot of fun. Uh, Cheryl Holson-Bake says, how gar flower garden plans for the spring? No, I don't, I don't have any flower garden plans now. I have made my peace with the fact that I, all, all that my flirtation with gardening did was give me another kind of thing to read, another kind of book to read. I now read gardening books. But gardening itself, I don't think I'm going to do it. I don't think I am. Uh, Last Sanchez says, Hi, Steve. What are your thoughts on Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson? It's brilliant. And what are some of the most impressive debut novels that you've ever read? Oh, my. That's another starter kit. I could do a huge list of them. Uh, as a second and completely unrelated question, can you recommend me a biography of late Arnold da Vinci? He, there's, he's, there's been quite a bit of great stuff written about him. I'd recommend Serge Bramley's biography. Um, as one that you could probably find used. It had a, a very healthy print run. Although uh, Charles Nichol, who did a great book called The Reckoning about Christopher Marlowe, also did a great book on Leonardo that I think had a paperback edition. So you could probably find that too. Uh, Charlie Wright says, Congratulations on 10K. I'm a longtime lurker uh, from the first time you were introduced on Chris's channel back in 2016. Uh, question, what do you consider to be the one, the most profound, and two, the most promising developments in this little corner of BookTube since you first started? Uh, well, number one, I don't, I don't know that we do profound on this corner book tube, and I'm very grateful for that fact. But the most significant is that in this little corner book tube, the videos have started to more, much closer resemble the infinite variety of actual the actual reading world, instead of the earliest days of book tube when it was all YA. It was just a bunch of adults talking about books written for children. Instead, in this little area of BookTube, you have people talking about all kinds of things. Whatever strikes their fancy, whatever they like or don't like. And the key is that we're not after money and we don't judge each other. If you're not after money and you don't judge each other, then you're free to talk about whatever book you want. I love that. Just love it. Uh, let's see here. Abelard Manu says, do you like stories of the Old West? Wyatt Earp, Bill, Wild Bill, etc. I do. Uh, I do. I don't tend to like them as much as some other readers, Peg at the History Shelf, for instance, or uh, Mark Richardson. Uh, but I do. I do like them. And what do you think of the movie Tombstone, especially Val Kilmer's Doc Holliday? I have no idea why Val Kilmer's Doc Holliday, and specifically that one line, I'll be your Huckleberry. I have no idea why that resonates the way it does in a certain fraction 
of uh, 21st century culture. I have no idea. To me, it seemed like an ordinary movie. But it is definitely has not been received that way by people who love it and can quote it from the first line to the last line, and especially who, if you were to remove that one line, I will be your Huckleberry from their life, their life would be significantly lessened. I just can't imagine that. I don't know where that comes from. Uh, but I do, I do like it, sure. Uh, Frabusi says, yo, gangster. <laughs> yo. <laughs> what kind of music, genres, favorite instruments, arrangements do you prefer? All John Philip Sousa, all the time. Can you listen to music while you read, or do you prefer compartmentalizing these uh, activities? I could listen to it, but I wouldn't pay attention to it. When I read, I am totally absorbed in what I'm reading. People can talk to me. The only thing that breaks that is dogs. So, music, if it's playing, I'm not hearing it. Uh, so, I could play it. What would be the point, though? Uh, Michael Moore says, congratulations on 10K. You must be a hit here in the UK. Oh, no. Far from it. <laughs> far from it. I don't think there is any booktuber that the UK booktubers hate more than me. I don't think there is one. Uh, because, and not because they know me. Not because they know anything about what they hate. They just, they, they have a tendency to move in lockstep with each other and that, that door has closed completely. Uh, my question, what are your thoughts on the seasonal quartet novels of Ali Smith? I like them very much. I'm waiting. I want to get a nice uniform paperback set. Maybe in a box. That would be great. I'm waiting. I don't have any of them now because I'm waiting for a nice set. Uh, Ronan Hutchinson says, Hi Steve, thank you for being such a kind and genuine person. Uh, due to the lockdown in the UK, I've been diving into fictional works that I usually avoid because of their endlessly bleak nature. By far, the book that has disturbed me the most is Last Days at the Bookland by Hubert Selby. My two questions are, what do you think of Selby as an author? He's really good. And what's your view on literature that is devoid of joy and leaves you with a haunted, hopeless feeling? It takes work to write such a thing. It's not easy. It's a definite literary effect, and that gets, you know, I doff my hat to that. But it's like you say, you have to read it in, in context of where the rest of your life is. I mean, the lockdown in the UK has been, I mean, you have really good news in the UK. Your rollout of the vaccine is, is really, really good. Uh, but the lockdown has been pretty hard. And just recently, uh, last Wednesday, you got a tiny foretaste of what you're going to pay for that lockdown. You got your budget, and it looks gruesome, absolutely gruesome. It looks it looks like uh, post World War II austerity is not far away in your future. That is all depressing. So why read bleak stuff? <laughs> I just, what I'm saying is, I guess the, the, my my point, the point of my answer is take care of yourself. Um, whether you read this stuff or not. <laughs> Uh, the Abiding Badger says, 10K? Nay, I don't want to see Steve go mainstream. Or do I? No, you don't. <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> Question, you may be 28 years old at heart, but what about getting older do you enjoy? I don't know what this at-heart business means. I am a incredibly sultry 28-year-old. Wavy black hair, bee sting lips, wash paper abs, dancer's hips, pillowy pecs. So I don't know this, what this at-heart business is. Let's just move on before we both say something that we regret, meaning you <laughs> say something you regret. Ingrid Fitz says, it's, uh, congrats, it's because we tell two friends and they tell two friends and so on. So, uh, Royal Tube says, hi Steve, you are absolutely certain you will never visit Australia or its neighbors. And yes, I will never visit Australia. What about the dingoes? Yes, the dingoes, a whole kind of dog that I have never met. Breaks my heart. Just breaks my heart. Uh, also, how was your experience in the Arctic? Fun with Arctic foxes. I did have fun with Arctic foxes. Yes, indeed. I did. I have felt their tiny little black tongues licking at my nose while my beagles and my other dogs looked on. An amazing alien kind of creature, but canine at heart. <laughs> Definitely a dog underneath there. Uh, uh, Nick Piccarilli says, Ken Burns' Civil War has come up a few times in your videos. Have you ever, have you enjoyed his other films? Yes. Uh, are you interested in seeing his upcoming one about Ernest Hemingway, even though you're not a big fan of him? Yes, sure. Uh, he's Burns is an artist, so I'll watch anything he does. Uh, Lydia Joy says, congratulations on 10K. Did you enjoy the Inspector Rosnikoff mysteries by Stuart Kaminsky? They're great. They're really, really good. One of my favorite series ever. Yeah, they're really, really good. Uh, and speaking of Russia, what's up with Gorky? What does that mean? Has Corky done something while I wasn't looking? What do you mean, what's up with Gorky? I don't know what that means. 
Uh, Julie Alvar says, another Q&A so soon. What a treat. There's something wrong with you people. <laughs> Number one, had it not been for the teacher who ignited your love of reading, do you think you would have come to it eventually on your own? I don't know. I might have. I, I, I dread it because the teacher that did it on my own had one standout teacher who introduced me to, to the joy, the wonder of reading. And I worry that if it hadn't been him, it would have been a, not a person, but a program. It would have been high school or college or post-grad, God forbid, and that it would have been, it would have ruined me as a reader. I recognize in myself, certainly, that I, I could have been ruined as a reader. I, I, I have a Jesuitical liking for doctrinaire systems of order. If I had if I'd had those locked into place and the ability to see them removed, I'd, I'd much prefer the way it happened. Uh, number two, what do you think of Quo Vadis or any other works by Sankiewicz? I like them. I think he's good. I've only read them in translation, but I like them. And number three, what do you think of Durrell's Alexandria Quartet? I like it. Uh, and number four, how tall are you? I am six foot one. No idea what that is in meters and centimeters and whatnot. I'm six foot one. Uh, Jim Chaplin says, congratulations, thoroughly deserved. Is it, though? Really? <laughs> uh, my question, if movie adaptations of books are almost always better than the novel they're based on, and you've long since persuaded me that you're right about this, why do we keep bothering with novels? Surely the sensible thing to do with this realization is to throw away our Kindles and concentrate on Netflix. <laughs> the answer is clear. Because we're all chasing after that high. We're chasing after that amazing feeling when a book is better than any movie adaptation could be when a book moves things around in your mind that amazing hair on end feeling of a great book a great transformative reading experience i am the first person to admit that such a feeling exists and it's the reason we all keep reading and as much as i love movie adaptations of works of literature they can't duplicate it uh, so that's why <laughs> Uh, chapter 21 says, Hello, Steve. Who are some of the famous people you have met? I love name dropping. <laughs> I've met quite a few famous people. I don't like name dropping. <laughs> <No. laughs> I've met, I met quite a few in the literary world and outside the literary world. Casper uh, Highland says, What is your opinion of War uh, Irving Wallace's novel, The Plot, for The March of the Mammoths? In March, we're, we're reading big books. It's a great choice, uh, as is anything by Irving Wallace. Talk about a great author who nobody knows anymore. Uh, the, the plot is probably his best book, but his novel, The Man, is amazing. And so are so many others. If you can find his books, his old books, get them all. They're so good. Uh, let's see here. Andreas Attic says, congratulations on 10K. That's amazing. Thank you. Uh, I think you are one of the best booktubers there is, and uh, the one I watch the most. Thank you. You are enthusiastic, funny, honest, and tell it like it is. I hope you decide to do your Marlowe book. I would definitely read it. Uh, when did you start reviewing books and why? Uh, well, I mentioned in an, earlier, in an earlier question just now, I started reviewing books a long, long time ago when a friend of mine who was an arts editor asked if I would write a book review for him, and I just loved it. I fell in love with doing it. Uh, Peter Gardner says, Hello, Steve. Congratulations. What are your thoughts on the Bosch series by Michael Connolly? How about the Louise Penny books? I like them both. They're, I recognize they're competently done, but they don't, do that, they don't do that magic thing for me. Neither one of them does and ever has. Um, Holden Caulfield Trowell Famadorian says, uh, hello, Steve, love the channel. Thank you. Uh, number one, could you please review in a sort of daily penguin format, any, if not all the Thomas Pynchon books? I know you love Mason and Dixon, yet you showed us Gravity's Rainbow, but a review of any of the Pynchon chunksters, uh, well, I could, sure. I, I don't know why I would, but I, and Pynchon is not lacking for attention on booktube, in our little corner of booktube or anywhere else, but... I could go through them book by book, yeah. Um, number two, what's your favorite Filipino literature of the ones you've read? I haven't read enough of it to, to rank things or start to speak. Uh, and number three, could you please do a starter kit on Wattpad books or books from online self-published fiction that you'd like to recommend to everyone? It's a great idea. Yeah, I really should pay more attention to Wattpad and fan fiction, a whole bunch of other places. I read a lot on those sites. And I naturally have critical judgments about what I read. I just don't talk about them and i really should i really that's a good idea i will have to think of a way to do it i haven't i haven't what i really ought to do is is um uh, last week in booktube or a uh, mega stuff video where i just routinely have a section where i mention self-published or indie published books just haven't settled on it yet that's all the year is still young uh 
Ancient Jocunda says, what do you think about keeping exotic invertebrates, especially tarantulas, as pets? I've never really understood it. I, I have heard from people who have tarantulas and a gigantic, one case of gigantic iguana, an iguana three times as big as Frida, uh, snakes. I've heard from people who have such pets that uh, they are friendly and that they're capable of recognizing different people. I had, a, I had a friend who swore to me up and down that her tiny little garden snake knew her from anyone else and reacted differently with other people than with her. Um, I would never do it. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a one species person, but I would never do it. And if I may be so cheeky as to ask a second question, what do you think of other exotic pets such as reptiles? Well, yeah, well, I didn't go straight invertebrate route, but yeah, I, I, I knew someone who had a big iguana, or I think it was an iguana, a big long-nailed green lizard as a pet. And I admit, the creature was very affectionate to him. Didn't seem to it went it turned into a rock, just a, a solid stone statue when I or my dogs were around. But it was very affectionate with him. I just didn't see the appeal. I didn't get any sense that that there was a connection between the two, which in a way makes sense to me. Is cats, dogs, horses, they have been shaped to have a connection. Humans have shaped them. Humans have made them into what they are, but not iguanas, not tarantulas, not anything like that. So I, I can understand it with a rat. Or a cat, or a dog, or a horse, but with a with a, a lizard, I, I don't know. It's, it's it's totally alien to me. Uh, Sarah Wilburn says, "Dear Steve, do you have a favorite wife of Henry VIII and a least favorite? My favorite is Catherine Parr, his last wife, and the uh, first woman to publish a book under her own name in the English language. Uh, and my least favorite is probably Catherine Howard, his dumbest wife." Uh, so I'm on pins and needles to see what Alison Weir, the histori historian and historical novelist Alison Weir, has been doing a series of novels about Henry VIII's wives. I'm hoping it's the last such series that we ever have. It's such a dumb way to look at the wives or Henry. Uh, but her novels have been largely good, and of course she's finishing up with Catherine Parr, and that's the next one. That comes out this spring. And I'm on pins and needles to see what kind of a job she does. Uh, let's see here. Levity Books says, Very happy to see your channel growing, Steve. You're the most prolific booktuber, so it's nice to see your hard work in original content and book reviews paying off. But do I work that hard? I mostly just sit in front of a camera without pants on and natter to my heart's content. <laughs> uh, some of us smaller channels feel pressured into doing these soul-destroying typical booktube videos, and it's good to see that you just do things your own way and is working through persistence. A question in case you need it even more. What book do you think represents the future style of what we think of as literary fiction? If that's too vague, what piece of experimental fiction have you most enjoyed? No, it's not too vague. I just have bad news. In my opinion, literary fiction is going to become autofiction. To the very limited extent that it hasn't already, it's just going to become unexpurgated literary journals, uh, journal entries of the authors, who have been bred like hothouse flowers in the MFA programs that exist all around the world now to tell them they are the greatest thing in the world, the greatest thing that's ever been in the world. And if maybe somebody in class timidly raises a hand and says, well, do you mean to include Jesus Christ? Then the teacher will say, get out. Yeah, this this person. Uh, on earth, we're briefly gorgeous. Uh, yeah, on, well, you're the greatest thing that's ever been. Not just a person, but anything. You're better than penicillin. You're better than the Great Pyramids of Giza. If you have an entire generation of authors who have gone through that experience nonstop since they were in high school, what are they going to write? Other than about themselves, about their own journal entries, with their own names, the names of everybody else, links to their social media. You can't criticize them. They've already been told. They've been told for... They're, what, 22 years old. They've been told for 12 years that, that all of that is not only interesting, it is not, <laughs> but also that it's the best thing that's ever happened. Why would they pick any other subject? That's what the future of literary fiction is, in my opinion. Uh, Rena is reading, says, has there been any progress on the odd dog biography? I, I, we had another question about this. I am working significant elements of autobiography into a collection of book reviews that I'm doing, but I'm not working on odd dog on its own at the moment. Uh, Mr. Putler Gollum, oh God, let's do him next, uh, says, congrats on 10K. After this week, it will be 11K. But you notice it did stop. It, the, that, that huge burst that we had did stop. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know about 11K. Number one, which Donna Tart is, book is the best? I have no idea. I like the Goldfinch the best, but I don't know. They all seem very similar to me in terms of just measurable quality. Number two, can you recommend similar authors to Donna Tart? 
Not off the top of my head. No. Uh, number three, do you read comics illustrated by Mobius or other European artists? No, I don't. I don't. They don't tend to do superheroes, and when they do, they tend to do them poorly. So I, I and that's all I read. I don't. That the comic books I read are superhero comics. Uh, let's stop there, and we'll move on to part four. <laughs>